of the dust, beginning August 1920. As summer week came right, so did I, born at home on the kitchen floor. Ma crouched, barefoot, bare-bottomed over the swept boards, because that's where Daddy said it'd be best. I came too fast for the doctor, bawling as soon as Daddy wiped his hand around inside my mouth. To hear Ma tell it, I hollered myself red the day I was born. Red's the color I've stayed ever since. Daddy named me Billy Joe. He wanted a boy. Instead, he got a long-legged girl with a wide mouth and cheekbones like bicycle handles. He got a red-headed, freckle-faced, narrow-hipped girl with a fondness for apples and a hunger for playing fierce piano. From the earliest I can remember, I've been restless in this little panhandle shack we call home, always getting in Ma's way with my pointy elbows, my fidgety legs. By the summer I turned nine, Daddy had given up about having a boy. He tried making me do. I look just like him. I can handle myself most everywhere he puts me, even on the tractor, though I don't like that much. Ma had tried having other babies. It never seemed to go right, except with me. But this morning, Ma let on is how she's expecting again. Other than the three of us, there's not much family to speak of. Daddy, the only Kelby left since Grandpa died from a cancer that ate up most of his skin. And Aunt Ellis, almost 14 years older than Daddy and living in Lubbock, a way south of here, and a whole world apart to hear Daddy tell it. And Ma, with only Great Uncle Floyd, old as ancient Indian bones and mean as a rattler, rotting away in that room down in Dallas. I'll be nearly 14, just like Aunt Ellis was when Daddy was born by the time this baby comes. Wonder if Daddy will get his boy this time. January 1934 Rabbit Battles Mr. Noble and Mr. Romney have a bet going as to who can kill the most rabbits. It all started at the rabbit drive last Monday over to Sturgis when Mr. Noble got himself worked up about the damage done to his crop by Jacks. Mr. Romney swore he'd had more ra rabbit trouble than anyone in Cimarron County. They pl pledged revenge on the rabbit population, wagering who could kill more. They ought to just shut up, betting on how many rabbits they can kill. Honestly, grown men clubbing bunnies to death makes me sick to my stomach. I know rabbits eat what they shouldn't, especially this time of year when they could ha hop halfway to liberal and still not find food. But Miss Freeland says if we keep plowing under the stuff they ought to be eating, what are they supposed to do? Mr. Noble and Mr. Romney came home from Sturgis Monday with 20 rabbits apiece, a tie. It should have stopped there, but Mr. Romney wasn't satisfied. He said, Noble cheated. He brought in rabbits somebody else killed. And so the contest goes on. Those men, they used to be best friends. Now they can't be civil with each other. They scowl as they pass on the street. I'm scowling too. But scowling won't bring the rabbits back. They're all skinned and cooked and eaten by now. At least they didn't end up in Romney and Noble's cook pots. They went to families that needed the meat. January 1934 Losing Livy Livy Killian moved away. I didn't want her to go. We'd been friends since first grade. The farewell party was Thursday night at the Old Rock Schoolhouse. Livy had something to tease each of us about, like Ray sleeping through reading class, and Hillary, who on her speeding, speed riding test put an even ton of children instead of an even ten. Livy said goodbye to each of us separately. She gave me a picture she'd made of me sitting in front of a piano, wearing my straw hat, an apple halfway to my mouth. I handed Livy the memory book we'd all filled with our different slants. I couldn't get the muscles in my throat relaxed enough to tell her how much I'd miss her. Livy helped clean up her own party, wiping spilled lemonade, gathering sandwich crusts, sweeping cookie crumbs from the floor, while the rest of us went home to study for semester reviews. Now Livy's gone west, out of the dust, on her way to California, where the wind takes a rest sometimes. 
and I'm wondering what kind of friend I am wanting my feet on that road to another place instead of Livy's. January 1934 Me and Mad Dog Arlie Wanderdale, who teaches music once a week at our school, though Ma says he's no teacher at all, just a local song plugger, Arlie Wanderdale asked if I'd like to play piano solo at the Palace Theater on Wednesday night. I grinned, pleased to be asked, and said, that'd be all right. I didn't know if Ma would let me. She's an old mule on the subject of my schooling. She says, you stay home on weeknights, Billy Joe, and mostly that's what I do. But Arlie Wanderdale said, the management asked me to bring them talent, Billy Joe, and I thought of you. Even before Mad Doc Craddock, I wondered. You and Mad Doc, Arlie Wanderdale said. Tarn that blue-eyed boy with his fine face and his smooth voice, twice as good as a plow bo boy has any right to be. I suspected Mad Dog had come first to Arlie Wanderdale's mind, but I didn't get too riled. Not so riled I couldn't say yes. January 1934 Permission to play. Sometimes, when Ma is busy in the kitchen, or scrubbing, or doing gouache, I can ask her something in such a way I annoy her just enough to get an answer, but not so much I get a no. That's a way I found of gaining what I want, by catching Ma off guard, especially when I'm after permission to play piano. Right out asking her is no good. She always gets testy about me playing, even though she's the one who truly taught me. Anyway, this time I caught her in the slow stirring of biscuits, her mind on other things. Maybe the baby growing inside her. I don't know. But anyhow, she was distracted enough. I was determined enough. This time, I got just what I wanted. Permission to play at the palace. January 1934. On stage, when I point my fingers at the keys... The music springs straight out of me. Right hand playing notes sharp as tongues, telling stories while the smooth, buttery rhythms back me up on the left. Folks sway in the palace aisles, grinning and stomping and out of breath, and the rest eyes shining, fingers snapping, feet tapping. It's the best I ever felt, playing hot piano, sizzling with Mad Dog, Swinging with the Black Mesa boys, or on my own, crazy pestering the keys. That is heaven. How supremely heaven playing piano can be. January 1934. Birthday for FDR. I played so well on Wednesday night. Arlie put his arm across my shoulder and asked me to come and perform at the president's birthday ball. Ma can't say no to this one. It's for President Roosevelt. Not that Mr. Roosevelt will actually be there, but the money collected at the ball, along with balls all over the country, will go, in the President's name, to the Warm Springs Foundation, where Mr. Roosevelt stayed once when he was sick. Someday, I plan to play for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself. Maybe I'll go all the way to the White House in Washington, D.C. In the meantime, it's pretty nice, Arlie, asking me to play twice for Joyce City. January 1934 Not too much to ask. We haven't had a good crop in three years, not since the bounty of 31. And we're all whittled down to the bone these days, even Ma with her new round belly. But still, when the committee came asking, Ma donated three jars of applesauce, and some cured pork, and a feed sack nighty she'd sewn for our coming baby. February 1934. Mr. Hardley's Money Handling. It was Daddy's birthday, and Ma decided to bake him a cake. There wasn't money enough for anything like a real present. Ma sent me to fetch the extras with 50 cents she'd been hiding away. Don't go to Joy City, Billy, she said. You can get what we need down at Hardly Store. I slipped the coins into my sweater pocket, the pocket without the hole, thinking about how many sheets of new music 50 cents could buy. 
Mr. Hardly glared when the Wonder Bread door banged shut behind me. He squinted as I creaked across the wooden floor. Mr. Hardly was in the habit of charging too much for his stale food, and he made bad change when he thought he could get away with it. I squinted back at him as I gave him Ma's order. Mr. Hardly's been worse than normal since his attic filled with dust and collapsed under the weight. He hired folks for the repairs and argued over every nail and every little minute. The whole place took shoveling for days before he could open again, and some stock was so bad it had to be thrown away. The stove clanked in the corner as Mr. Hardly filled Ma's order. I could smell apples, ground coffee, and peppermint. I sorted through the patterns on the food bags, sneezed dust, blew my nose. When Mr. Hardly finished sacking my things, I paid the bill, and tucking the list in my pocket along with the change, hurried home so Ma could bake the cake before Daddy came in. But after Ma emptied the sack, setting each packet out on the oilcloth, she counted her change, and I remembered with a sinking feeling that I hadn't kept an eye on Mr. Hardly's money handling, and Mr. Hardly had cheated again. Only this time, he cheated himself, giving us four cents extra. So, while Ma mixed a cake, I walked back to Mr. Hardly's store, back through the dust, back through the Wonder Bread door, and thinking about the secondhand music in a moldy box at the shop in Joyce City, music I could have for two cents a sheet, I placed Mr. Hardly's overpayment on the counter and turned to head back home. Mr. Hardly cleared his throat, and I wondered for a moment if he'd call me back to offer a piece of peppermint or pick me out an apple from the crate, but he didn't, and that's okay. Ma would have thrown a fit if I'd taken a gift from him. February 1934 Fifty miles south of home, in Amarillo, wind blew plate glass windows in, tore electric signs down, ripped wheat straight out of the ground. February 1934 Rules of dining. Ma has rules for setting the table. I place plates upside down, grass, glasses bottom side up, napkins folded over forks, knives, and spoons. When dinner is ready, we sit down together and Ma says, now. We shake out our napkins, spread them on our laps, and flip over our glasses and plates, exposing neat circles, round comments on what life would be without dust. Daddy says, the potatoes are peppered plenty tonight, Polly, and chocolate milk for dinner, aren't we in clover? When really all our pepper and chocolate, it's nothing but dust. I heard word from Livy Killian. The Killians can't find work, can't get food. Livy's brother, Reuben, 15 last summer, took off, thinking to make it on his own. I hope he's okay. With a baby growing inside Ma, it scares me thinking, where would we be without somewhere to live? Without some work to do? Without something to eat? At least we've got milk, even if we have to chew on it. February 1934 Breaking Drought After 70 days of wind and sun, of wind and clouds, of wind and sand, after 70 days of wind and dust, a little rain came. February 1934. Dazzled. In the kitchen, she's my ma. In the barns and fields, she's my daddy's wife. But in the parlor, ma is something different. She isn't much to look at, so long and skinny, her teeth poor, her dark hair always needing the wash. But from the time I was four, I remember being dazzled by her whenever she played the piano. Daddy bought it, an old Kramer, his wedding gift to her. She came to this house and found gaps in the walls, a rusty bed, no running water, and that piano gleaming in the corner. Daddy gets soft eyes standing behind her while she plays. I want someone to look that way at me. On my fifth birthday, Ma sat me down beside her and started me to reading music, 
started me to playing. I'm not half so good as Ma. She can pull Daddy into the parlor, even after the last milking. When he's so beat, he barely knows his own name, and all he wants is a mattress under his bones. You've got to be something to get his notice that time of day, but Ma can. I'm not half so good with my crazy playing as she is with her fine tunes and her fancy finger work, but I'm good enough for Arlie, I guess. March 1934. Debts. Daddy is thinking of taking a loan from Mr. Roosevelt and his men to get some new wheat planted where the winter crop has spindled out and died. Mr. Roosevelt promises Daddy won't have to pay a dime until the crops come in. Daddy says, I can turn the fields over, start again. It's sure to rain soon. Wheat's sure to grow. Ma says, what if it doesn't? Daddy takes off his hat, roughs up his hair, puts the hat back on. Of course it'll rain, he says. Ma says, Bay, it hasn't rained enough to grow wheat in three years. Daddy looks like a light brewing. He takes that red face of his out to the barn to keep from feuding with my pregnant Ma. I ask Ma how, after all this time, Daddy still believes in rain. Well, it rains enough, Ma says, now and again, to keep a person hoping. But even if it didn't, your Daddy would have to believe. It's coming on spring, and he's a farmer. March 1934 Val as Maggoty Stew. Arlie Wanderdale said the rehearsals for Sunny of Sunnyside shouldn't take me out of school more than twice next week. When I told Ma, she got angry about my missing school to play piano for some show. Me and Daddy, we're trying our best to please Ma, for fear of what it might do to the baby if we don't. I don't know why she's so against my playing. She says that school is important, but I do all right in school. I know she doesn't like the kind of music I play, but sometimes I think she's just plain jealous when I'm at the piano and she's not. Maybe she's a little afraid of me going somewhere with the music she can't follow, or of the music taking me so far away one day I'll never come home. Whatever the reason, she said I couldn't do it. Arlie had to get somebody to take my place. I do as she says. I go to school, and then in the afternoons I come home run through my chores, do my reading and my math work at the kitchen table, and all the while I glare at Ma's back with a scowl fowls maggoty stew. March 1934 State Tests When I got home, I told Ma our school scored higher than the whole state on achievement tests, and I scored top of 8th grade. Ma nodded, I knew you could. That's all she said. She was proud, I could tell. But she didn't coo like Mad Dog's Ma, or go on like Miss Killian used to do. Daddy says, that's not your Ma's way. But I wish it was. I wish she'd give me a little more to hold on to than I knew you could. Instead, she makes me feel like she's just taking me in like I was so much flannel dry on the line. March 1934 fields of flashing light. I heard the wind rise and stumbled from my bed down the stairs, out the front door, into the yard. The night sky kept flashing. Lightning danced down its spiny legs. I sensed it before I knew it was coming. I heard it, smelled it, tasted it. Dust. While Ma and Daddy slept, the dust came, tearing up fields where the winter wheat, set for harvest in June, stood helpless. I watched the plants surviving after so much drought and so much wind. I watched them fry or flatten or blow away like bits of cast off rags. It wasn't until the dust turned toward the house like a fired locomotive and I fled, barefoot and breathless, back inside. It wasn't until the dust hissed against the windows until it ratcheted the roof that Daddy woke. He ran into the storm, his overalls half-hooked over his union suit. 
Daddy, I called, you can't stop dust. Ma told me to cover the beds, put the scatter, push the scatter rugs against the doors, dampen the rags against the windows. Wiping dust out of everything, she made coffee and biscuits, waiting for Daddy to come in. Sometime after four, rubbing low on her back, Ma sank down into a chair at the kitchen table and covered her face. Daddy didn't come back for hours, not until the temperature dropped so low it brought snow. Ma and I sighed, grateful, staring out at the dirty flakes, but our relief didn't last. The wind snatched that snow right off the fields, leaving behind a sea of dust, waves and waves and waves of dust rippling across our yard. Daddy came in. He sat across from Ma and blew his nose. Mud streamed out. He coughed and spit out mud. If he had cried, his tears would have been mud too, but he didn't cry, and neither did Ma. March 1934